I'm Andre Freund. I work for Citus Data, and uh, I'm a PostgreSQL developer and committer. And I spend most of my time playing around with Postgres in one way or another. And today I want to talk about uh, how does Postgres deal with I/O and how that influences performance, because that's something that's actually like closely related. And sometimes it's hard to understand why. A you need to tune a parameter to make performance better or why it makes it things worse. So if you run a, like a throughput tests on normal Postgres and you didn't tune it with 9.6, you often get graphs like this. The blue line is uh, the number of transactions per second. The red line is latency in milliseconds. And you can see that it's a pretty terrible picture. In this case, this was done on my uh, workstation at home, unfortunately on rotating media because I had destroyed my SSDs with tests the day before. They're not, they don't last all that long. Um, but yeah, that, uh, it doesn't really change if you use uh, SSDs. The latency numbers are not quite as bad. But obviously, this is a pretty bad picture. But then it's also done with the default parameters. So there's a reason why it's uh, bad. So that's basically, I want to see why this looks this way. I want to explain how, why it looks that way and how you can make it better. For that, we unfortunately need to look a bit into the architecture of how Postgres works. And the basic uh, architecture is this, that we have uh, various processes. They, they, these are the things in the middle, the connections. We have some background processes like the check pointer and some other internal uh, processes, and they all access some local memory that's just whatever when you call malloc or postgres as palloc that's allocated on the left hand side and they all are attached to some common memory that's a shared memory and that's where we store like we buffer io where we have locking information to coordinate between the connections and by like by size the buffer cache or what you configure by shared buffers is going to be the largest part of uh, shared memory most of the time. And since shared memory obviously influences, uh, like shared buffers influences how I.O. works, I'm going to explain a bit how that looks like. But it basically looks like this. We have one hash uh, table that says, this block in this table is mapped to this block in our shared buffers. And then each shared buffers page is eight kilobytes of data, and then some uh, flags and locks and so on associated with that. And uh, but it begin initially when you start the database, the hash table will be empty and all the buffers in shared buffers will not contain anything. So how does actually reading data work? So whenever you do need a page from some table in memory to read it, for example, because you did a select star from table, what happens when when the query execution engine finds I need the first block. It looks into the hash table, checks whether the specific entry in the hash table already has a block associated with it. If, the, uh, if there is one, then that's easy, then we can reuse that. So on further executions, we don't have to do the AO to the operating system again. But in the case we don't have, what we do is we find a free block in shared buffers. If there are no free blocks, we'll have to do something else, but that's the next step. So once we found one, we point the entry in the, this shared uh, table and lock, acquire some logs and do some internal stuff. And then the next part is the important part. We ask the operating system, please uh, open the file and give us that block. And what's important in contrast in Postgres to some other operating systems, Postgres does not use uh, direct IO. So uh, when it does a read call, system call, the OS may have it already cached. So in the f a bit faster case, the OS's own page cache will say, OK, here you go, that's the page. If that's not the case, the OS then will ask the storage to uh, read the, give the data back, and that will take a bit longer, but it will eventually also have read it. And once that's done, we can load the data in our shared buffers, and then we are done and can return the page to our internal user. So what does happen if the data is actually, if we don't have a sh free shared buffers because our workload is bigger than our shared buffer setting? That will not always be the case, but especially in the default configuration, it quite frequently will. 
The algorithm Postgres uses for that is called a clock sweep algorithm. And we earlier saw that I had uh, arranged all the shared buffers basically in a list from zero to however you many you have configured. And uh, the clock basically arranges this, uh, the number of buffers uh, just in a circular, uh, in a circle. And when we have one clock hand, and the clock hand is basically shared by all processes. That's where, we, where the clock is pointing at. And when we need a new page, what we do, we look at the buffer that's at the moment under the clock hand. And each page has a so-called usage count. And the usage count is basically information about how often has this page been used. So let's say that in this case, we have the page has a usage count of four. That means it has been used somewhat recently. Uh, so we can't directly reuse it because then we would potentially throw out useful content. So what we do is we just say, okay, now we have looked at it, so we decrement the usage count by one, and uh, then look at the next one. And at the next uh, page, we do the same again, and so on. And at some point, we'll find a page that has a usage count of zero. Potentially, that means we have to go around the whole clock of all pages uh, by the number, the maximum type, the number of usage count, and that at the moment is five. So potentially, we have to go around the whole clock a uh, number of times. So, and once we have found that page, we either will just throw out the old content or we'll potentially have to write out the current content because if somebody had written something to that page, it might have been updated in memory, then we obviously need to update the file system view of that page with the, with the new content. And that works uh, the following way. We again, we just have the entry in our shared buffers and then we need to lock the page and that's relatively boring. What we then do, we do a write system call to the operating system. And there, here's important again, we don't use odirect. We write to the operating system and the operating system does its own caching. And after that, we just say, okay, we are done with writing out. And uh, yeah. So there's one more very important part about the, how to understand how databases, and not just Postgres, generally do I.O. And that is for consistency, uh, most databases use something like val logging, undo logging, and that basically works like that. If you, whenever you do a modification to the database, say you insert a record, you insert something into a log, and that says insert into table so-and-so this content, and whenever you commit, you say commit transaction so-and-so, and you write that. And so you have this log that with, with, with each modification that which grows a bit, and whenever you uh, commit a transaction, you don't have to write out all the changes made to all the data tables. What you do is you just say, sync the log up to this position. And then you can return the commit to the user, and whenever, so the, yeah. And whenever this log then grows, obviously, the, the, all the time. And when you, at some point, it might happen that your database crashes because your hardware goes out because you kill nine the Postgres process or something. In that case, what happens, we start at the log from the point where we started the database, basically, and just look at the log, log entries. When the log entry says, insert something into that position in the table, then you do that when you, so when it says mark this transaction as committed because it committed or aborted, then you do that. So we go through the log and uh, replay all that actions. Uh, that's how the durability ha uh, happens because we have redone all the uh, operations that have happened since the crash and now we are up to date again. And once we did this crash recovery, you can say, okay, we just start at the new position from where up to where we did crash recovery and then we can just accept writes again and we'll fill the uh, val again. And the reason I had this, these small bits at the beginning and then the larger block is that in Postgres, the val is by default uh, created in 16 megabyte chunks and these are each physical files. And you'll have sometimes interact with those 16 megabyte files if you ever did like point in time recovery or st streaming replication or something like that. So. When, once the database is working again, what happens, it'll just create new log entries, and the log entry, the log will grow and grow and grow. And at some point, uh, you have the problem that the log will have grown 
to an indefinite size because so far we don't know how to remove old log entries. And the process, th that's obviously not something you can do because over the lifetime of a database, you write, will write many more times the amount of disk space you want to have available for that. Also, if you never, if you ever always start at the beginning of the uh, data of uh, the val, at, after a crash, it will take a lot of time. So there's a process called uh, checkpointing, which basically says, I'm trying to write out, out of shared buffers, all the modification that I've done previously and write them to disk. And then I'm F-syncing all the files in the database, which means that all the old modifications are now safely on disk. And I can say, now I can remove the old log entries that are, were made before my checkpoint. So I can now just delete the files and continue writing. It's important to know that in Postgres, this checkpoint doesn't happen like in the foreground and while uh, it's blocking, but this happens in the background. You can continue writing while that happens. So in, it's all a bit more complicated than I'm drawing here, but that suffices basically for the basic understanding. And then we can just continue writing. And the way how reading and writing is done and how checkpoints are done influ uh, explain a lot of the performance problems. That's why I went with it to explaining them. So when do we do these checkpoints and why is that important? By default, we, the, the default setting is checkpoint timeout equals five minutes. So every five minutes, we go through shared buffers and write out all the dirty buffers in shared buffers. And uh, that's important because like, if you say my, my shared buffers is one terabyte of memory and I, write, uh, I dirty all of those five terabytes of memory, uh, one terabyte of memory all the, with, all the time, and then you do checkpoints every uh, five minutes, then you can calculate what your maximum write rate from checkpointing is. Because it will be five, uh, uh, one terabyte divided by five minutes, uh, so you'll have a very high constant write rate. So you need an IO subsystem that can handle that. There's also other reasons why we can start checkpoints. When the val grows too much, then we say, okay, we want to write, create a new checkpoint because we want to remove the old entries so we don't use arbitrary amounts of disk. And uh, up to 9.5, the configuration variable for that was checkpoint segments. And it was defaulting to three, which meant that after 48 megabytes, we wanted to do a checkpoint. And that obviously is in practice ridiculously low for anything that has a high write throughput. In uh, 9.5, we, we have a different setting, which is max val size, and that has a slightly less insane default setting. And the relation between, the reason we renamed that is that checkpoint segments had the problem that uh, the actual, actual amount of disk space we needed was more than checkpoint segments. You had to basically multiply things around to figure out how much the disk space is going to be. That's why we renamed it and rejiggered how this all work and it's now max vault size. And whenever, in, if you enable the logging of checkpoints, you will see that if you, if that's the reason why a checkpoint is started, you will see checkpoints starting X log. And potentially also, oh, checkpoints are happening too frequently. You're, this is not good for performance. It will warn you every now and then. You also can trigger checkpoints manually by saying checkpoint in the, uh, SQ, uh, via SQL, and they will start that. And up to, I think, 8.3, the way we did checkpoints was that we had some process that did the checkpointing, but it tried to do so as fast as possible. So if you had shared buffers set to, I don't know, 100 gigabytes, it tried to write all the dirty buffers in these 100 gigabytes as fast as possible, and then went to f-sync all the data. But if you imagine writing out at, su at a certain point in time, one gigabyte, uh, 100 gigabytes of data out, that will make everything else very slow. So what uh, was introduced back then is spreading checkpoints. So we'll just say our checkpoints are allowed to take longer because it's not that important that we remove all, all uh, val immediately. So by default, it uses a, a setting named checkpoint completion target, and it's set to 0 0.5. What that means is that we try to finish a checkpoint by half the time the next checkpoint starts. And that means we'll just sleep whenever something is happening and when we've done some work and we compute how far we have to go and sleep accordingly. And yeah, it, that me, but that means also that if 
you have too much work to do during checkpointing, uh, and uh, the completion target might not play a role. It might not slow down things if you, if you wouldn't finish otherwise. So to go back to the graph from earlier, I said earlier that this is an untuned Postgres installation. And you can see that after, I don't know, I don't know whether you can see it, I can't see the screen. After, I don't know, 20 seconds, it starts to get very slow. And then it's slow for a period and then it starts to be fast again. So what did we tune wrong? The first uh, thing we might assume is that the default shared buffer setting was uh, too low. So let's increase shared buffers to something larger, in this case 16 gigabytes, and that actually makes the whole workload fit into shared memory. But you can see it might have slightly improved performance, but it's still pretty bad. So what we can guess na next is, okay, the default setting for checkpoint segments are very low. So what happens is that we will frequently do a checkpoint. And that's whenever a checkpoint starts, you can see that the uh, performance tanks very, very badly. And that's because the checkpoint is writing out data quickly. Because every, we very quickly exceed checkpoint segments, or max val size in this case, because I did this test with 9.6. And it's busy doing that. And that slows down throughput and increases latency, because every write takes longer because of the checkpoint also happening. So let's try increase uh, uh, the max val size. So checkpoints happen less frequently. And the result is this. Note that the scale at the bottom changed. It, the whole, here's the entirety is uh, 300 seconds. Now the first 300 seconds are where the performance is consistently very good. And then we see after 300 seconds, the performance goes down. What happens is that then, at that point, a checkpoint starts and starts to write out data. And suddenly we have this zigzag uh, pattern where performance is very good for a short moment of time and then very bad for a short moment of time. So why would, would that be? I said earlier that whenever we write out data from the database, we just write it out to the kernel. And uh, we don't use odirect, so it caches the data in its, uh, on its own. And then every now and then will, the kernel will decide, now I have cached enough memory and I need to write it out. So one assumption, possible assumption is that we write out, the kernel writes out the data in a not very regular manner. So we can monitor the kernel for how much dirty data it has. And this is the graph that shows, the red line shows how much, uh, the, the blue line shows how much dirty data it has. And as you can see, you have very similar patterns to performance. So the problem is basically that the kernel caches too much and then whenever it writes data back, uh, performance suffers. So one idea would be we can change the OS configuration to tell the kernel to cache a lot less. And for pure database UTP style, style workload that actually can up to 9.5, uh, including 9.5, be a very good idea. What you can do, you basically can tell the kernel to write data out more often. That means you can reduce dirty writeback sentisex to a lower setting, or you can say write out data whenever more than the, these kind of bytes are dirty, and that's dirty bytes ratio. So the, one of the problems with it is obviously that it can increase the total amount of writes and it can increase how much, uh, how random the IO is because the kernel will try to do some reordering. It's not that good at it, at least in Linux, but it trials to do some of that. So if you try tell the kernel that it shouldn't cache more than 40 megabytes of dirty data, you'll get to this kind of workload, which already looks uh, a fair bit better. We can now see that performance is very good for 300 seconds, and then we are slower for about 150 or something, and then the performance is very good. And now we can see actually the effect of the checkpoint completion target that I mentioned earlier. You can see that after 300 seconds we start a checkpoint and we try to finish that checkpoint by half the time we have to start the next one. And that's exactly these 150 seconds where the performance is lower. So what, we, what the next thing we, you could do is try to spread the cost of the checkpoint over more time. So what you can do, we can increase checkpoint completion target to something higher. 
then you'll end up with like something like this. I think I set it to 0 0.9. And that's already pretty good. I mean, performance is still not as good as if there were no checkpoint, but that's pretty obvious. If you don't do any writes, performance will be better. But and one thing to also consider is that this, wor this benchmark is a saturation test. We try to do writes as fast as possible. Most applications aren't that way. That means most of the time you, your application has a certain demand for a number of writes. Say, I need to do a 1,000 transactions a second or something. And everything is OK. It's, it doesn't, it's not a benefit to you if you can do 10,000 transactions a second if you don't have 10,000 transactions to process a second. So the important part is just to, to get the performance above your, uh, the required uh, baseline. And so increasing checkpoints, uh, the completion target can very often achieve that by spreading the work. So to get back from the example to more how you can tune things, the, I'll give some basic guidelines about how to do tune sh shared buffers. The most important part is you shouldn't tune shared buffers to something that's high. Question. Yeah, sure. Uh, next slide. Oh, okay. Give me one slide, and then I'll, come, I'll ask you afterwards whether it answered your question. So in shared buffers, the most important part is leave enough uh, memory to actually have other work to do. Like the queries sometimes need memory for sorting. You're, you might want to run uh, applications. You want to do run aggregates. So you shouldn't set shared buffers to like 90% of the memory of your machine. <clears throat> then. There's some problems, which I'm going to go into very little detail later, but you should only set shared buffers to a very, very large setting if you can fit your hot, hot data set into, if you can fit your working set into shared buffers. Because in those cases, none of the scalability limitations around shared buffers in Postgres really matter to you. So if you have a workload where you can say, I have a 256 gigabytes of memory, and my workload actually is like um, 100 gigabytes large, then it can make a lot of sense to set shared buffers to 128 gigabytes. There unfortunately are a few exceptions to that. If you do very frequently do a drop table or re-index of tables or something like that, then large shared buffers will hurt you. Because unfortunately, we only have a hash table, as I explained earlier, over uh, shared buffers. So when we drop a relation, we need to remove all the pages that are in shared buffers. So our solution to that is we walk through all shared buffers to check whether it's a relevant page and then remove it. So that can increase the cost. That normally doesn't matter for production workloads, but for regression test workloads, it can make a huge difference. I've seen regression tests go from minutes to seconds by re re uh, reducing shared buffers. The other cases are if you have bulk writes in a workload which is bigger than shared buffers, then reducing shared buffers counterintuitively can often increase performance. And if you remember, I was talking about this clock sweep earlier. The reason for that is that then it just can take the clock sweep a lot longer to find a replacement page. And the clock sweep then often will have to write out dirty data from shared buffers. So that can increase the cost. And if you actually use a large shared buffer se uh, setting con and you use Linux, consider configuring huge pages because that can drastically reduce the per process overhead of having a large shared buffers. So that's the basic guidelines so for uh, shared buffers. So for the right ahead lock, for the sizing of checkpoints, the most important guideline is you should always have checkpoints triggered by time, never by the limit of the val size. So what you want to do is to size your checkpoints so by checkpoint setting appropriate checkpoint times uh, out and max val size that the timing uh, triggers them. The reason for that is that but the timing is a lot easier to estimate about how long, it's easy to estimate how long five minutes take because you can, <laughs> they're five minutes. So we can spread the work on a very regular basis. But if the 
uh, if we have to do checkpoints because uh, of the valve size, the, your workload might not be completely predictable. So we might need to speed up and slow down the checkpointing, and that can influence your perfor application performance. So it's okay if you have like a nightly batch job and then checkpoint segments is the limiting factor because you might not have other work queries, but that's the basic. And one, the other important part is that increasing checkpoint segments uh, means uh, like having lo larger checkpoints increases how much time you spend on recovery. Because uh, after a crash, you need to replay all the routes. So if you have a thousand uh, segments, that will take longer if you have only 10. A very, very rough guideline is that you, uh, in current hardware, you usually can do like three to eight segments a second to replay if you have good, decent ish hardware. But there's unfortunately also a contra argument to having a relatively small checkpoint segments besides the amount of total I.O. The other, uh, that is that <clears throat> whenever a page has been touched first in, uh, after a checkpoint, we don't just write the change, like for example, we updated a row, we also write a so-called full page image. That means we lock the whole content of the page into the val, and that can drastically increase the amount of val. I've seen uh, cases where increasing checkpoint uh, timeout from five minutes to one hour reduce the total amount of val by more than a factor of five. So we went from, I don't know, 100 something gigabytes an hour to 20, just because we did need lo a lot less from these uh, uh, full page writes. And having less of these full page writes also influences replication performance, because they're pretty large and you have to transport them, you have to write them on both sides. So often increasing the number of checkpoint segments increases uh, the replication performance, actually. It, but it also decrease, uh, increases the amount of time a new base backup uh, takes till it can accept read queries or till it's uh, recovered. Does that kind of answer your question or not? Yes. It's, no, no, yeah. We stream, like, if you stream replication, we continuously send the data in uh, eight kilobyte chunks or uh, 16 kilobyte chunks or something. And we can apply in these increments. And if you use, like, uh, archive based uh, replication, like with uh, archive command and recovery command, then it's 16 megabytes because the val is always written in 16 megabyte increments. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's pretty easy to create scenarios where your network can't keep up with the amount of val. I mean, I've seen 40 gigabyte links saturated with val. So. Yeah. So there's some performance features in Postgres that try to uh, make this all more efficient. There's the val writer, which does write, just tries to write val so backends don't have to do it when they do the insertion, but there's not really anything to tune, and it's mostly important if you use asynchronous commit. But you can't tune it, so it's, it's there and does a job. Then there's another uh, thing that's pretty important, which is, uh, I said earlier that if the clock sweep finds a dirty uh, buffer that it replaces, it, it has to write out that buffer. And that means that the a query that does like a select suddenly has to write out data, which is you don't want it to do that work because uh, it should answer the query as fast as possible. So there exists a process called the background writer that basically just looks at the next few buffers ahead of the clock and tries to write them out. Unfortunately, uh, that thing is overly complicated and uh, under effective. And uh, one of the problem there is that the defaults are very bad for uh, any real high, uh, high throughput workloads because its configuration values limit the amount of maximum work it can do to four megabytes a second. And if you have uh, any OEO throughput, that's not very interesting. So 
if you want, you can tune it by configuring the two settings at the, bill, uh, b uh, at the bottom. That's BG write to delay, which means how long does it sleep if it sleeps after doing some work, and BG write to LIU max pages after how many pages it has written out, it does it sleep. You can increase that, but unfortunately, even then, it's not very good. It's too complicated, and we're working on replacing it for Leonard 7. And surprisingly, there's another very similar process which has a lot of uh, needs tuning in pretty much every database that's not of trivial size, and that's actually auto vacuum. And that causes the, uh, in my experience, the most downtimes of Postgres is that auto vacuum is not tuned. Because uh, it is by default also cost limited, and the cost limits uh, it has limit it to four megabytes of work per second at the max and often lower than that. And that means that uh, if you have more than four megabytes of writes a second, it can't keep up. And then you'll just fall behind. And that's how you often end up with databases that have these huge amounts of bloat. If you ever had auto vacuum problems and you ran the default configuration, this is likely the reason. So you will, if you don't, if you run a non-toy database, you will have to, uh, Oh, there's a mistake. The it vacuum cost page miss, the default is not 20, it's two. Sorry. Oh, 10, yeah, okay. So, but I mean, th this value is, oh, I copied the value twice, that's the reason. Yeah, okay. Oh, that, that's what yeah, so, okay, sorry. There's a mistake there. And what, but the way it works that it just calculates uh, a cost factor, cost while performing its work, and after it reached cost limit, which is by default 200, it sleeps for <coughs> 20 milliseconds. And if you do the math, that ends up that if you have more than four megabytes of dirty data, you'll, that's the maximum you can do, basically. So you need to tune that if you have any write activity in your database. One of the, if you have decent hardware, you can often just disable the cost limiting by setting, I'm only sleeping zero seconds, uh, milliseconds, that works often. Otherwise, you'll need a lot higher uh, cost limit and lower uh, cost delay. So, yeah, do that. Then we have this problem with what we saw earlier, that the kernel uh, caches all these writes and uh, writes them back to the uh, hardware in uh, uh, irregular patterns. And one of the ways we can do that is by changing these OS dirty defaults. But we can, what you can also do is we can just force the hand of the kernel to write out data on a more regular basis. And that's what we did in 9.06. So in 9.06, you don't need to do this EO dirty data tuning because the dirty data tuning has a lot of problems. If you have other writes where you don't want to immediately write them out, for example, you have a temp table or you have a disk space sort, you don't run the, the, those to hit uh, disk unnecessarily. So we have now in 906 a feature that works on Linux and some other platforms, but not as well as on Linux, where it uh, just forces the kernel to write out pages if they've dirted more than, depending on what, what writes them out, a couple megabytes. And to uh, uh, alleviate the cost, that, uh, the problem that that increases the amount of random IO, the checkpointer now sorts the writes. And that's something we should have done long ago. And uh, the other problem I mentioned is that the hash table at the moment, uh, we can't do any sort of uh, give me the next buffer in the file very efficiently. What we have to do is we have to do a completely uh, separate lookup for that. And we can't use the hash table for sorting because hash tables by definition have no sorting. And that causes a lot, number of problems. And the other problem part of that is, the problem is that hash tables are actually, see, from an uh, efficiency point of view, they are 01, that, or in the normal case. But uh, the problem is that the, co the constant cost factor for something that's accessed across multiple CPUs is not very, is pretty bad. So we probably have to replace the hash table by something else. Also, we had a number of locking issues around this hash table because this hash table can be accessed, by, is often accessed by all processes. So the locking around that is very important. Uh, the most important improvements have been in 9.5. So if you run into uh, locking issues before 9.5, upgrade to 
We have some more important uh, improvements in 906, but those are mostly if you have uh, a working set that's a lot larger than the database, uh, than memory. And I think the best uh, replacement for the data structures we use as a, instead of a hash table, we should use a radix tree. I'm trying to work on that. I'm not 100% sure I can get it into 907, but that's my hope. The other big problem is uh, that our cache replacement scales not very, uh, scales badly. I mean, you saw this clock earlier. In the past, what we did, we, whenever we wanted to get a buffer from that clock, we just acquired a global lock, and only one buffer could advance that, uh, one process could advance that clock and look for replacement pages. We fixed that in 905 by better, by using atomic operations, but the, still the problem is this clock has to be advanced. And if I said earlier that we sometimes have to go around the whole clock five times to find a replacement buffer. And if you have a couple million of shared buffers going through a couple mil, an area of a couple million, that's really expensive. So our fundamental, uh, fundamental cache replacement algorithm is just not very efficient. And the reason for that is that it's mostly been designed uh, for efficient uh, changing of the reference count, which is very nice, but the replacement has got, become so inefficient that with today's memory sizes that I think we need to replace the fundamental in algorithm. I don't really know how to, what would be good there. We've, there been various people rep uh, proposing different algorithms, but it's pretty hard. The other problem is that uh, this, th th this maximum usage count uh, is five, and that only means we have a very low granularity about how often pages are accessed. You often reach a state where you have all buffers have a usage count of five, and then the clock goes around to reduce all of them to zero, or all of them to one or zero, and then buffers get replaced. And so you have very little locality. And that's something that you can actually see sometimes in the database using the, the PG buffer cache, cache uh, extension. And that's actually a very interesting thing to do in your database. Look at how regular your usage count is, because that allows you to do some estimation about how well does the caching work in your database. If you have a very unique, uh, unidistributed uh, usage count, that usually means that your workload is bigger than, a lot bigger than shared buffers, that you have a very, that the caching doesn't really work that well. If you have uh, mostly a high usage count and then a third or so that's very, uh, that's a lot lower, that means you have a uh, well-cached workload. And you can, by looking at how that develops over time, you can estimate how soon you're going to hit the wall of, okay, my cache is too small. Another problem is uh, that I said earlier, we don't use odirect, and the, uh, that's a problem because that means that the kernel page cache con can contain uh, cache data, and that uh, Postgres caches the data, and that can mean we just waste memory doing con caching the same, or nearly the same data twice. It's unfortunately not that easy to get, uh, to use just o use odirect, which avoids using this page cache, because uh, the Linux, do, uh, or most kernels do a lot of optimization about how to queue uh, I.O. to devices. And if you don't use, uh, use the facilities to do that, things get slower. So I think we, we're making slow progress in being able to do that, but we're by far not there. there. The other big problem is that it's a very OS specific, so we can't easily do it because the Linux implementation would look very different than the even Solaris implementation or FreeBSD implementation or even more so than the Windows implementation. Okay, this is basically what I wanted to go through. If, are there any questions? <laughs>